Welcome to Chaos Orchestra episode number nine, Cognitive Graph Analytics. Our today's guest is Jans Asmann, CEO of France Inc. and a luminary in the area of knowledge graphs and cognitive modeling. Having someone like Jans on the show, I obviously try to ask all the technical and philosophical questions around knowledge graphs and cognitive models that I had. So we're going to talk about modeling of complex systems, such as organizations and societies, digital immortality, cognitive knowledge models, but also the future of knowledge graphs and artificial intelligence. Another question I asked Jans was, if knowledge graphs are as powerful as we think, why didn't they solve all the COVID-19 related data integration problems? And what about all the other problems of humanity we talked about on this podcast before? Talking to Jans was, as always, thought-provoking and inspiring. As usual, I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did. So my thesis was about modeling car driver behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And I wrote a, uh, in Lisp a simulated world where cars would drive around. And you could also see that world on a screen. Now remember, this is like a, at least 30 years ago. And the interesting thing was that we had people look at the screen to see how normal the behavior of each individual car was yeah so it was people thought this was without any human modeling this was just i tried to get the right behavior of every person in the in the traffic world and then one of the cars was a cognitive model and that the model had to control where you were looking at any point in time uh, it had to use the body to control the car so it was a stick shift car right uh, it had to deal with auto traffic had to deal with the upcoming intersection it had to deal with navigation so doing multiple tasks at the same time and so all of that was done with a modeling system called soar from carnegie mellon where, where i also spent some time um, and that modeling system was entirely based on uh, graphs yeah so it had a short-term and long-term memory that consisted of graphs and rules so i mean i still think that knowledge graphs are systems that consist of graphs and rules so for me that <laughs> it's not a big jump you know i'm still doing the same thing that i was doing like 35 40 years ago current machine learning model is reaching some kind of a limit yeah in the sense that it's really really good at pattern recognition but it can't do very complicated planning right and so when I was doing my car model, uh, I had like a, probably a thousand rules and I was simulating the fact that I could recognize other objects, right? Um, because the, it just wasn't good enough, the machine learning at the time, not powerful enough. I really wish I could do my thesis again because I think that the, the best knowledge graphs of the future will be a mix of uh, machine learning and advanced analytics. Um, well, like, what, I, what I call the statistical AI, but there will be also a symbolic AI that is kind of the context for the statistic AI. So I think the future will be a mix of rule-based processing, uh, deep planning, and in combination with uh, machine learning and, and other statistical methods. Can you give an example of a, of a use case where all these all these technologies are kind of working together? I think in uh, if you look at cars, self-driving cars, right? Part of dealing with cars, especially in complex situations, is that you have to understand the others. Yeah, uh, you can train as much as you want on data, but then suddenly something really unexpected happens. Yeah, and if you don't have a pattern for that then it well then you better just break and hope that no one <laughs> hits you from behind whereas if you had a system that had a lot more real world knowledge and that understood what people were doing and trying to do yeah you probably could create a context for the machine learning to make better decisions but i think it applies in many cases right um, in healthcare for example uh, of course you can look at the series of events of a single person and, and lots of other people like you and come up with some kind of prediction based on machine learning yeah but it also will help that you have a full understanding of all the biological processes in the body right 
and uh, how, how diseases develop, yeah, to combine that with statistical phenomena. I think it will actually apply almost everywhere, a mix of machine learning and symbolic processing. So you, you mentioned healthcare and uh, now being in the middle of a global pandemic where we have uh, a lot of different uh, sources for data, heterogeneous data formats and uh, big amounts of data looking for patterns, trying to integrate them and aggregate all this data, you would be like, okay, I mean, um, symbolic AI or knowledge graphs and maybe even some aspects of statistical AI are perfect for that. I mean, this is, this is the holy grail for this problem. But for some reason, it's, it doesn't seem to be the ultimate solution. Well, because it is actually more an organizational problem than a technical problem. I think most problems that I see where we as a company try to help other companies with knowledge graph, building the knowledge graph and doing reasoning over that and doing analytics over that, that's the easy part. The hard part is getting the data, yeah, the right data. That's always hard. So I remember in the beginning of the pandemic, I have a friend who was the research director for medical devices um, at Kaiser here in California. And he tried to organize a knowledge graph just around best practices for medical devices and in general for COVID. Because the problem was that every, even down to every municipality, city, a county state where people trying to find the information about what to do should we wear masks or not uh, do people need to be intubated or not yeah which med medications are working what medications are not working yeah and um there was every day hundreds of reports coming out from all over the world in different languages yeah and so we we were trying to see if we could do a knowledge graph, but there were so many obstacles. One of them, there was no taxonomy for all the new terms related around uh, SARS-CoV-2 or, 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 co or coronavirus, right? Um, there was, the, in the world of medical devices, there's already really a long time a problem that people don't have standards for how you describe these medical devices, right? It's uh, every vendor, comes up with their own des description of the device and it's really, really hard to compare them. And then you, well, um, I, we're now a year in and if you now go to the NCBI a website of, for, uh, of N, the NA, NIH, then you now see that you have thousands of articles about COVID research, clinical trials, uh, data sets, so now we're got, getting to the point where it's actually possible to build a knowledge graph, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of amazing that within a year we got to this point that you now can take all that knowledge and combine it in knowledge graph. We're working on one where we take all the clinical trials, combine it with UMLS, and then look at all the symptoms that long haulers have and try to determine, okay, what are the processes that that can explain why certain people get it, other people don't get it, what, what's all involved. Um, and well, this is not the time to show it, but <laughs> it's, it's amazing what kind of data sets are available already. So yeah, I think knowledge graphs will be the solution, but in the beginning, it was just an organizational problem to get all the data together. But we're getting very close, I think. From in the next year, we'll see uh, uh, knowledge graphs that will give you great, great insight what's actually happening. The situation different if you look at like at one hospital or at one institution? Well, we've been fortunate to work with a big hospital chain in New York, actually in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. um, but when you say hospital, you, th you think, well, the one big building and everything happens inside. Well, actually, that's a hospital that bought eight other hospitals, yeah and in numerous clinics. And every clinic has their own uh, system, you know, for operational processes uh, and, and, and for planning and uh, patient appointments and how you do your testing and how you record the testing. So it's an absolute total chaos, yeah? which would fit really well in your, your podcast series. <laughs> it's total absolute chaos. So one of the things we saw there 
is that um, you, you need a completely new paradigm to record all patient data. Do you think we can actually save lives by, by implementing semantic technologies in hospitals? Or is it more of, a, of an optimization of some management processes? Oh, no, absolutely save lives. Yeah, so uh, the hospital that we work with uh, worked with the Mayo Clinic on a model that could predict whether or not a person would get into um, respiratory problems. Yeah, and then that model would, uh, if 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 the if the calculation of the model got to a certain value, then the doctors are warned warned that the that the patient needs intubation, right? And that model is many times better than doctors, yeah, because it can look at so many different variables that the doctor just doesn't have time for. And so that was just a very simple case where they could do the, 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 their model on top of a, a knowledge graph that contained all the data of the patients. Yeah? And then uh, the next thing they did was to discover uh, whether or not someone has an early form of sepsis. Yeah? And again, they had a big team of people doing that. And it was not going really well. And then they asked the, the person that was doing the knowledge graph in, the, in, 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 in that hospital, hey, can you use your knowledge graph to help us with this? And within three weeks, he built a model to um, see if someone uh, has uh, sepsis or early onset of sepsis. So sepsis is not an easy thing to see. You need to have, I believe, three out of five symptoms and then you have early sepsis. Now, sepsis is really dangerous, of course, right? Um, because if you have that, then the doctors have to fight to keep you alive. But the, the interesting thing is one, the model now allows you to discover sepsis in a very really early stage, but two, you can now start predicting based on the patient history, whether or not you're gonna get sepsis, yeah? And every case of sepsis you can avoid will save, well, have a high opportunity to actually save a life. Mm -hmm because it's so incredibly dangerous. You have to get people antibiotics within a few hours, otherwise it's just too late. By earlier detecting that someone gets into trouble or even preventing that someone gets in trouble, yeah? And that's just because you can see the, the data for this patient with such clarity, and you can do all so many calculations that just are going to predict whether or not a patient is gonna get in trouble, that it will help enormously and save money and save lives. Let's stay with this healthcare example. As we said, the future systems will probably um, consist of something like a combination of symbolic and statistical AI, right? We might call this ultimate uh, technology in the end, might call it uh, AGI or whatever. But um, I have the feeling that for now, these two technologies are developing separately. So whenever we use them at the same time, it's, it's a modular system. Right, because you still would probably struggle in representing probabilities and time dependencies in the knowledge graph, right? So where do we have to catch up on the technology side here? Well, one thing that the hospital did is they um, did a topological analysis of people with diabetes. And so normally we think, well, there's two or three types of diabetes but they did a technique where they showed, and I forget the number, I think it was about 22 different types of diabetes. Yeah, so a way more fine-grained cluster analysis of people with diabetes. So now you have these, say, 22 groups. Now you can take that group number and put it back on the patient. So now, now you know for each patient their group number. And then when you do further analytics about why certain medications or procedures work, you can take that number into account and now you suddenly see that, well, oh, this medication only works for these numbers, but not for these numbers. So what you've done is you've created a learning system. So in, the, in, in that knowledge graph of the hospital, it's really a learning knowledge graph where every analytics that is done is fed back into the knowledge graph. So you, you learn something yeah, about the patient using machine learning or any other technique, you put it back in the knowledge graph. If you uh, and then you can use that for the next follow-up 
type of learning, wave of learning that you're going to do. Does that make sense? So it's like a layers of learning, mm -hmm. starting at, at, the, at the bottom where you just look at symptoms that people have, but in the next waves, you use the, the classifications of people. So you don't have to recompute everything all the time. But that is a beautiful, beautiful example of, on the one hand, having lots and lots of sparkle rules, you know, to kind of figure out if, if someone belongs to a certain class or uh, and, and, and machine learning where you made predictions and, and now you can combine them in one query language. Um, and, and it's and it's a hundred percent hybrid system of machine learning and, and, uh, and semantic technology. Do you think Sparkle Star and RDF Star or reification, um, whatever is existent right now, is enough to represent probabilities in a knowledge graph, probabilities of relations? Yeah, I, I, I don't see why not. Yeah, I mean, with the with RDF star, you now can say anything you want about a particular triple. Yeah, so you can say A has disease Y. Yeah, and the probability that he has that is, mm -hmm. I don't know, 0.8. And the severity is 0.3. <laughs> You can, you can, yeah, and I made this particular statement at this particular date, yeah, and it's valid till this date. Yeah, you, you can say whatever you want to say about every triple now. It seems to be important in, in healthcare, not just in what order events happened, but also what what the what the time between different events is, right? So, and I mean, time trees are obviously not a great solution to uh, for that representing everything in a graph. Um, how would you handle that? Um, well, two answers. So the way we deal with patient data is, so, I mean, in, in the hospital, in, in the Bronx, they have God knows how many uh, enterprise data warehouses mm -hmm. and other repositories. And then of course you have HL7 and fire streams and you have real time data coming from the ICU. And it's just, it's just a total mess it's impossible to do analytics just on that stray data so we came up with the model that we call the entity event model yeah where you say well let's choose the core entity that we care about and that we analyze and that's the patient and then let's map anything in any database to a core event of something that can happen to a patient so basically um uh, the hospital made an ontology of, of everything that can happen to a patient, whether it's a diagnosis, a test, a particular disease, a medication, a medication order, paying a bill, checking in, checking out, dying. They're just events, simple events with a, a type, a start time and an end time. And then some key value pairs that describe a little bit more. Events can have sub events, but suddenly everything becomes a very simple object. So the shape of the data gets very, very simple. And they have found that they can take literally all the data in the hospital and map it to that simple structure of an entity with events attached. Well, that's it. Um, so now we have per entity a stream of events and possibly sub events, right? Um, but that doesn't solve the problem of that graph databases are not. Um, like like a, also regular relational databases, they're not meant for for doing a very complicated queries over time. Yeah, so we are working on adding um, special time based indices to the database to make it way faster to deal with time, and um, especially for vital signs that are coming from the ICU and other places, you just don't even want to put it in the graph, right? And so we're experimenting with mixing graph databases with time with time databases, yeah. Where the raw data, yeah, I mean, if you get the heartbeat every second, yeah, or actually, you said, if you want ECG, you want to have even more than that, yeah. You would just flood the graph with core knowledge. So basically, you want to have a a, a time database that is good at what it does, namely storing time, yeah and then do the summaries of that in the, in the knowledge graph. And even that will get you into the hundreds of billions of triple, believe me. Yeah. So I think there's a, um, but even then when, when you leave all that 
um, low level um, uh, measurement data in a time database, you still have a lot of events. You can have thousands, tens of thousands of events. Yeah. And most queries, well, let me say that almost every query in healthcare is, has a component of time. Yeah. Someone first got a symptom of this nature. And by the way, when I say of this nature, it means that it, it, there's not one word for it, but it could be like three or four levels high in the taxonomy tree, right? Yeah. And then within a month, someone got another disease or a particular disease. And again, not a single word, but something that's that can be somewhere high in the taxonomy tree. Mm -hmm. So I've seen queries where you ask for three, four, five, six symptoms in a particular row. Yeah. And so now you have to do this over 2 million patients. So that query will blow up. So in order to solve that, you really need a cluster, cluster solutions. You need sharding so that you can have, do your, all your temporal calculations on smaller shards. Yeah. Just to keep a, a, a grip on, on the computation time, if that makes sense. The relational databases kind of store the state of the world as they know it at a particular point in time. So you can say, okay, look at my inventory, da inventory database and see how many things I think things X I have, right? And it'll give you the answer. If you do event modeling in a relational database, you basically have to go through, <laughs> through all the, the transactions where you got the thing X and deleted thing X and then I have to do the computation. So that's a little bit of a difference between um, regular modeling and relational database and event modeling. But I think that also applies to um, knowledge graphs, yeah? Where we came up with this technique where we say, well, every, in almost every business application, what you're interested is in series of events, not in the current state so much, but okay, what happened, right? So that's why we came up with this entity event model, yeah, that, that we're now trying in a bank, uh, we're doing it in a call center, uh, we're doing it in a hospital, uh, we're doing it for a large government uh, organization where we always have the same pattern. You choose the core entity that you care about and then you attach all these events to that core entity, right? So that the queries that you have to do become way more simple and it is way, way easier to explain the data to people than, than going through a very, very complex schema. We also came up with a way where we um, group all the semantic facts or triples around the patient yeah, mm -hmm. in one, what we call a graph. Yeah? So if you look at the patient, it can be a very deep tree, four or five levels deep of a entity. Sorry, the entity is the patient, events, sub-events, then going, say, into billing codes to the point where you finally hit the knowledge bases that know about the meaning of words. But what we do is we group all the end, the events that happen with the respect to a particular patient together in one graph using the fourth element of triples. And so now suddenly we can do a 360 view of a patient and just within half a second, I can say, give me everything I know about this patient and I get the results back. If you ask that in a, a regular hospital, give me everything you have about this patient that ever happened to this patient, it will never happen. It will, they look at you and they're like you're crazy because how do you do a SQL query where you basically <laughs> go through every table to find if you possibly have something about this particular patient, right? So we pay the price um, up front, yeah, <laughs> where we have this mapping process and map all the data into uh, this entity event model. But then afterwards, you get all the benefits, easy queries and getting a 360 view of the, pa of the patient without any trouble. So yeah, let, let, let's talk about Spark here. I mean, it's it's a very intuitive query language as all graph query languages probably are, um, but you still you still run into huge problems as soon as, for example, you try to write recursive queries or anything that looks like a bit of a procedure and stuff like that, right? It's still a query language. Yeah. Um, and a knowledge graph would present very complex knowledge. So it would be, really beneficial to be able to operate um, on them and be able to, to execute way more complex uh, operations than you can just do with Sparkle because unlike relational databases, you're actually able to handle all this, all this 
um, context and all this complex information. So um, yeah, I mean, I know you, you're using Lisp and Prolog on this. What do you think about that? And are there any other solutions? And what do you think, how we will handle that in the future? When we had version 0.1 of our database, yeah, we only had Prolog. So we had B-trees <laughs> to store the triples. And then we already had a Prolog compiler in our Lisp. So I could do uh, Prolog queries from day one, recursive queries, everything that is complicated, no problem at all. And it, and it almost looked like a regular data log. So from day one, 15 years ago, we had a data log slash Prolog on our data. Um, then of course the semantic world really went into Sparkle. Um, so we implemented Sparkle, went through three or four iterations before we're happy with what we have right now. Um, and it's a it's a very easy language to learn actually, Sparkle, yeah? I mean, if you're a relational database per person, then it takes one or two hours that, because I give a lot of training, I see really good relational database programmers, in two hours they got it, yeah? Because the aggregate functions are totally the same in Sparkle as in relational databases. And once they know how to do complex joins in Sparkle, they kind of never want to go back to SQL. They get they, they really see why it's so easy to specify complex joins in Sparkle. Um, and so another benefit of Sparkle is you can implement a set-based query engine. So um, Initially, we had a depth first query engine that works really well for Prolog, but for Sparkle, it was just not good enough. And so we went out and got a set based one. Um, and so I use both languages. I use Prolog um, for if I, if I have a starting point, yeah, I want to know some, something more about the node that I already know beforehand. And I use Sparkle if I say, give me all the patients that first had this disease and then had that disease, yeah, where, and then do some counting operation because that's what Sparkle is for. But to, to take a step back, and, and a, a deeper reason for me to use Prolog is that Sparkle, like any other que query language, whether it's Cypher, Sparkle, or, or the, the future graph query language, they're not programming languages. They are uh, 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 query languages. And so sometimes we get customers that say, hey, this query doesn't work really well. And then we get a query that has uh, five pages of text, right? <laughs> and, and we say, well, it's not entirely a surprise, you know, I mean, did you count that, you, that you're literally doing like a 500 joints in this query, right? Um, and so A, the query is very hard for us to understand, even to debug it, and, and, and B, it's, I mean, making a little change in your data just completely ruins your, um, your your Sparkle query. So I'm a big fan of Prolog because to begin with, when you when you know when you write applications with Sparkle, you see a lot of repetition in your Sparkle query. Sparkle doesn't have a mechanism. Well, Spin could help a little bit with that, but it doesn't have a mechanism to shorten your queries where you can take parts of queries, turn it into a function, and then combine functions, right? So that's already one at, uh, advantage of, of, uh, of Prolog. And then Prolog is a full Turing complete programming language, right? So if I want to write a rule-based system, I can do that in Prolog. Uh, if I want to shorten my rules, I can do that in Prolog. If I want to do recursion, it's not a problem at all. So, um, yeah. If you think five or 10 or 15 years ahead, Will there be an enhanced version of SparkL that is able to handle things like recursions and, um, you know, repeating joints and queries, or will there be a, will graph databases have to have a native programming language? Well, I think we'll, uh, we'll see a recurrence of data log, yeah, which is kind of a simplified version of, of prolog. And I think then that, because total data, data log allows you to, to do a query condensing, condensing right? Um, it can do also the same query engine techniques that you do with, uh, with, with Sparkle, but it has also some of the advantages of Prolog. And I think that some, 
if people do data log, they also allow the insertion of prolog in your data log. Yes, yeah, so if you wanted a recursion or a specific pattern, mm -hmm. uh, we have a version of data log. Yeah, but if you want to, you can just secretly ing ingest prolog and it won't even know better, it will just execute. <laughs> Of course, now it's your responsibility to make a very efficient uh, prolog query. Yeah, because making prolog queries up, uh, uh, um, optimize that, that's pretty hard for, for a, a query optimizer. But a big advantage of prolog is again, that you can do parallel prolog. If you look at parallel query languages, you'll see, I, I would bet that a third of them are about parallel prolog. <laughs> So even we already have kind of a parallel prolog, yeah. Where you, if you have a uh, sixteen processes in your in your system, you can just use all sixteen to do the query. That's going to be a big benefit too over, over time. Might seem like a radical topic switch, but uh, can you elaborate on the concept of digital immortality and uh, on the role of knowledge graphs in that? There's several sides to it. So uh, at some point, uh, our company was running a website called Pandora Bots. Yeah, where we were running bots. Um, to, so people could do, yeah, just like Eliza, you know, I mean, everyone know, now knows what a bot is. <laughs> and we found it's really, really hard to make uh, bots work for an enterprise system. And, but we're actually still actively working on that right now. Um, but like, I, I think it was 15 years ago, I already had an intern uh, that was looking to see how you could make a uh, granddad immortal. Yeah. So basically our idea was that you could get, um, you made a survey or a questionnaire and you would do endless amount of questions and then you put that in the bot. And so in the future, you could talk to granddad, right? Just ask questions. So what school did you go to? And what teachers did you have? And uh, what did you think about this and that? What did you do in the war? What did you do here? What did you do there? So that you just get a, a, a beautiful, like a, more like a cognitive picture of your granddad, right? So that's one, one way to talk about it. The second thing is, if I think about digital immortality and, and knowledge graphs, it's um, these bots are usually only good at one sentence and one and one answer. Yeah, they're not conversational systems that keep track of every part in the whole conversation. So they don't really understand the world. And my big uh, belief is that what you need knowledge graphs for with bots is that you literally have the pragmatics of the world in your system. You know about physical laws, about how transportation work, how cooking works, how interaction between people work, how uh, repairing things work, how buying a house works. And we have schemas for everything in life. And once we, we understand all of that, then we actually can understand, um, then, then bots can maybe start really talking to other people and then again, that would make uh, the digital immortal bot of granddad a lot, lot better. But there's yet another angle to digital immortality and we're working with that. For example, we're building a knowledge graph of all the work that Noam Chomsky ever wrote. Yeah. And we kind of use it as a test bed to think about natural language understanding, natural language processing in general. How do you represent causality? How do you um, well, I mean, you, you can imagine, right? And so we, we take the, the books, turn them into, in, in, uh, in documents, turn it into chapters and paragraphs and, and then even sentences. And then we apply all kinds of uh, NLP techniques to it. And the, the idea is again, to create a bot in the future. It can actually talk to the knowledge graphs and ask questions about, hey, Noam Chomsky, what do you think about the effects of poverty on women's participation in the in the workforce yeah some company at some point that's just going to offer it maybe we're going to do that yeah where people can pay to get all that stuff analyzed and put in a, and, and then create a bot around it so that in the future we can talk to 
Winston Churchill, yeah, or Noam Chomsky, or, or Einstein, or whatever, would be awesome. Yeah, if that thing were very, very realistic. Yeah, it seems like one of the one of the main challenges is to actually find out this causal chains, right? If you're able to yeah. to uh, represent everything Noam Chomsky said about all the political events, and you can somehow tie them together with uh, cause effect relations. I mean, that would be the holy grail, isn't it? I mean, you could even combine it with all the newspapers and whatever else you'll find. Yeah. Well, but it's not easy. <laughs> so the Stanford's research, re Stanford Research Institute, SRI, worked for many years on a project where they took a biology 101 uh, book for college. And they wanted to be able to create a knowledge graph around that book so that regular high school students could talk to the book, right? And they had a team, and I, I forget the numbers, but there's probably, they spent like 20, 30 men years yeah, to take every sentence in the biology book and turn it into a kind of a causal statement, yeah? This enzyme causes this, happen in this particular pathway. This pathway has this effect on how you're going to look like. Yeah? <laughs> so you get this, uh, it was, but it, they learned a lot. It was a very interesting project. So of course the issue is, can I automate finding causal connections, right? And um, well, I know you worked a little bit on it and some other people in my company have worked on it. So can I automatically find causal connections yeah, in, a, in a body of work? Because, I mean, so if you look at natural language processing, I mean, everyone now can do entity extraction. Yeah, and you've got, you can choose from 10 different libraries that will help you with that. Finding facts or, or relationships extraction or event extraction is already way harder. Yeah, because now you have to represent in some way that uh, say that company A merged with company B, right? Or that company A is suing this person, this particular person there. And there's so many ways to express that, that that is kind of the state of the art right now to make that easier. And there's both people on the rule-based side that are trying to, fix, to, to, to solve it. And there's people using um, machine learning and, and big models like BERT to figure that out. Um, but again, if you don't understand the world on a deeper level, I have a knowledge graph that understands the world on a much, much deeper level, all of that will be still very, very superficial. Maybe for a very small domain, you can fix it. But for the richer domain of life, it's going to be pretty hard. Yeah. So I think that, uh, so again, we started, I'm a, I don't know if we even said it, but I'm a cognitive psychologist, right? And I started with modeling human behavior and I looked at, okay, how can I make a, a, a human understand the world so that I, I can model their behavior? Well, I think that cognitive psychology will be working for the next hundred years, you know, <laughs> to put human knowledge into a knowledge graph that you then can use to automate tasks. Because just learning patterns is not gonna do it. you learning patterns in machine learning. It needs an embedding in the pragmatics of the world. How would that look like? So could we, I mean, we have now the school algorithms that recently became extremely well, like co-reference resolution, where, you know, a book is not just a collection of facts, but you can actually tie them together somehow and see where objects relate to other objects and stuff like that. So do you think that this building of this cognitive model and extracting this human knowledge from all this will, will be automated from all these books? Or will it be more something where we actually have to to model something manually um, rather than extracting and abstracting it? Well, again, it will be um, a mix. I mean, I, I, um, I was a big fan of Roger Schenk and his, and his books about, um, what was it? Goal scripts, plans and understanding. I'm probably mixing it up the, the order, but, <laughs> and he had this, um, frame or slot filler approach, yeah, where he, he, I think he had about 13, he, he said that English language consists of only, again, numbers might be wrong, 13 verbs, yeah, and then most verbs are just a variation of one of these 13 verbs, and for each verb, 
you can create a frame to fill in slots, right? Yeah, so um, go, if you say, if you look at the verb go, then there has to be a person or something that goes from, from something to a place, yeah? With a, some, some vehicle or just walking. And anyway, yeah, you can come up with a set of slots uh, that need to be filled in when you want to understand that. So having these core verbs and relationships defined is very important. You have to do that manually, but I can really imagine that you can actually detect that using machine learning. Yeah. You, you can, you can then train a, probably a machine learning model to fill in those, those frames. So it's going to be a combination. So here's the thing. I, I mean, I look at my, um, my working life and I started as a cognitive psychologist and I uh, started just doing this cognitive modeling, working around graphs. And 40 years later, I'm um, still working with graphs and I think there's still an incredible opportunity, yeah, to work closer together with psychologists. I also kind of have a hobby where I look at modeling uh, societies, artificial societies, right? Um, I think, and I see now there's more companies coming up that are doing simulation research, yeah? Sometimes it's hard to get real data and then these people will go through the trouble almost to the level of SimCity, you know, where you try to, to model all the regularities in, in society, yeah? To kind of do a very realistic simulation. Um, but I think especially in these days, um, I, I still think that knowledge graphs also can play a role in modeling societies, yeah? Where you create a, a begin set of people um, in an artificial city with artificial streets, with um, streets uh, and, and transportation, schools and shops and malls and factories where people work and try to see how far you can get with uh, kind of creating artificial societies that you can use for sociological research, for example, yeah? Why do we get segregation? Why uh, do certain models work well economically? Why does others go completely wrong? What are the parameters that determine that? And I still don't see much of that work happening in economics or anyone else. And um, well, I'm kind of, that's one of the hobbies that I'm so now and then play a little bit with, yeah? But you always find out it's going to take so much time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But so two questions. First question yeah. is how how can we model such a society with a knowledge graph, and uh, what do you think how complex that could be and how much time it would take? And the second question would be, once we are able to do that, isn't this like the first step to technocracy, where if we know what factors determine our societies and economics and stuff like that i mean who who can better predict what's good or bad than the system itself right and, oh no no it's very scary research absolutely i mean already many many years ago we worked for a, a big uh telecom in asia and we did a poc where i could prove that if i see all people's telecom data right, and location data, and I have a GIS database of the city, right, I can tell you very quickly your age and your gender and your belief system, yeah, what you believe and the things you like to buy and what your best friends are and what, and what church you go, what kind of sports you like, uh, what your preferences are for music, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, it was scary as hell to figure that out. But, you know, right now we leave it all up to... Uh, to Facebook and Google that already know all of that, right? <laughs> but it would be really interesting to have public research, open source public resource, yeah? Where we try to see what are the mechanisms to compute all of this? Yeah, what are the signals I need to kind of completely understand or mostly understand people's behavior? And then what can we do? Yeah, or can we then even prove how big companies like F Facebook and Google are using and misusing it? Yeah, and how governments can misuse it. Because right now we have no clue how they do it, right? And most people have no clue what they do and how they do it. So it's a very good point. I mean, 
the social networks basically are a model of our society. I don't know, it's just one perspective, but yeah. Yeah, we, we also um, worked on a proposal for DARPA to look at uh, fake information. Yeah, mm -hmm. again, we used our, 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 our graph database for that, you know, just can I see patterns of new news coming up? What are the topics in that news? What kind of people spread it? So again, it's a kind of a different knowledge graph, but still, yeah, can we use that to, to find out if someone doing a new misinformation campaign? It's another fun topic. Well, we did the fairly obvious thing. You had to sample all the news that you can get on Facebook groups and, and, and other groups uh, and Twitter and uh, newspaper information and, and mm -hmm. uh, podcast websites. Yeah. And just analyze the text and see if there's new topics coming up and new. Um, and there was a human in the loop system, by the way, and new statements about facts that were provably false. <laughs> Because if if new facts come up that are provably false that didn't happen, right? Then then we have already misinformation. Sometimes it's even inadvertently. Yeah, most of the time it's it's really done on purpose. So, um, um, but yeah, truth and, and 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 trust are really hard ones too. You know, because you look at the United States, everyone. I mean, half of the people really really trusted Trump. Yeah, and the other half deeply distrusted and they, they had their own people that they trusted so <laughs> on a bigger scale yeah what is trust probably just so, an occupation value <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah that's true that's true listen Jens so uh, I, I know it's, it's a nearly rhetorical and impossible to answer question but since you've been in this area for 40 years, and uh, what do you think, how far away are we from fully modeling companies, societies, and maybe even psychologies uh, of, of, of humans um, with a knowledge graph or some additional technologies? Do you think how far away are we from that to actually being able to use that into having robot CEOs and technocracy and you know systems ruling over societies and maybe even systems analyzing human psychologies and stuff like that well i think we're already in the middle of it so 